Hi, I'm Randall Theo. I am the president of the DFW chapter of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. This is a liberal atheist comic. Let's do this thing. and you're big pimping with the LAC. On this episode of Cringetastic, we're going to talk about the five reasons why Mother Teresa was cringetastic. I'm joined by Randall Theo, the president of the Dallas-Fort Worth chapter of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Randy, you were raised Catholic, weren't you? Oh, I absolutely was. I grew up in a house where Mother Teresa's picture hung right next to the Pope's. Well, I was married to a Catholic girl, so I can understand the picture of Mother Teresa and the Pope. Uh, only difference in her house, they had a picture of John Kennedy up there, too. <laughs> so as you were growing up, what did they teach you about Mother Teresa? Pretty much that she could do no wrong. She was about the closest thing to God manifesting on earth. I remember when I heard Mother Teresa died, I remember having a sense of dread um, not sadness, but I thought, well, once she's dead, why would God even keep the world around anymore? That's how important she was to us. Well, that's the story that most people hear. Now we're going to talk about the reality. Now, I think it was either Plato, Aristotle, or Bobby Gentry in her song, Fancy, described a conversation that Agnes, which was her born name, had with her mother on how to get out of the backwaters of Albania. Now, I read somewhere, or I'm just making this up, Agnes said, Mama, what do I do? And Mama said, just be nice to the gentlemen, Agnes, and they'll be nice to you. So, number five on our list, she liked bad boys. What do you have for me? Well, I'd say the first bad boy on the list would be Baby Doc Duvalier. He was the uh, brutal dictator of Haiti. That in and of itself is a fascinating relationship because Haiti's not a Catholic country. Um, Haiti does not have a lot of rich people, so those are two things that don't really fit Mother Teresa well, yet she had a very tight relationship with him. Early on in his career, he awarded her some big medal for their, uh, their country, probably their equivalent to the President's um, Medal of Honor. And somehow that, that always enraptures her. She always liked going to places where they made her the center of attention. Um, of course, to us Catholics, it was to bring the plight of the poor in front of everybody. But we kind of see now that it's more, she, she liked, the, the, um, she liked the, the attention. She liked the adulation that came with that. But she developed a relationship with him while he was doing horrible things to the Haitian people. Um, she, she acted as if he did no wrong. Yeah, baby Doc Duvalier was kind of the Eric Trump of the Duvalier family. That gene pool just wasn't deep enough to support another generation. So, anything else? Oh, we're just getting started. <laughs> you got her situation over with Union Carbide, which was a um, company that uh, had a horrible accident in the 1980s that killed lots of people. And instead of what you would expect, uh, which was prayer for the fallen and prayers for the survivors and the injured, 
um, she asked them to forgive the company. You know, no worries doesn't seem to me to be the appropriate response to seven to 10,000 people being killed over a three-day period because of corporate malfeasance. No worries is something that you say when someone bumps into your cart at Kroger. Well, I mean, you've got, let's see, a guy that looted his country and killed his people. You've got a company that killed thousands of people. That's got to be it. There, there can't be anything else, right? Well, you can bring in her support of a pedophile priest. Oh, Lord. Apparently, this guy had been, uh, there are stories that go back to the 1960s that uh, he had been abusing children. And Mother Teresa wrote a letter on his behalf in 1994 to his superiors. Now, a letter from Mother Teresa means the world uh, in the Catholic Church. So it was most certainly read. It was most certainly believed. Um, but the abuse continued for another 11 years until this priest was ultimately arrested and is now sitting in jail. So he got to abuse people for 11 more years after uh, this, Mother Teresa wrote this letter on his behalf. You know, I can kind of understand, you know, a, a nun not having the moral courage to fight pedophilia in the Catholic Church back then. But to write a letter of support to a kitty diddling priest is just mind-boggling to me. I, yeah, this is starting to wear me out. I think we need to move on. Now, Randy, I can't prove that Eminem was thinking of an Albanian dwarf dressed as a penguin when he wrote, I'm Slim Shady, yes, I'm the real Shady. All the other Slim Shadies are just imitating. But it's probably as true as the Bible. So number four on our list, shady financial dealings. What do you have for me? Well, Mother Teresa was an excellent fundraiser. And I don't think she set out to be that. In early parts of her career, that wasn't anything that she cared about. But once her story got out there, like any good Catholics, Catholics sent her money. Uh, my parents sent her money. Her religious order was by far the wealthiest religious order in the Catholic Church. Um, she she couldn't go anywhere without carrying a big handbag and people would literally stuff money into her handbag. She could pull out tens of thousands of dollars or euros or yen uh, at any given point. Uh, and we can't really blame her for that. If people want to give her money, they gave her money. And, um, you know, and, but she also wrapped her arms around some pretty scary people along the way. You have Charles Keating, who was caught up in the savings loan scandals of the 1980s that gave her lots and lots of money. Now you could see how that would be a bit of a symbiotic relationship. Here he was bulking millions of dollars out of good, hardworking American people, um, but he was giving money to Mother Teresa, that that made it all good. Mother Teresa didn't care where the money came from as long as she had it so that she could continue building her massive operation around the world. So that was something that uh, made them both feel good. So how could it possibly be wrong? Well, Charles Keating was also a big anti-pornography guy, if I remember. Uh, apparently, screwing people financially in public was not a problem to him. And, you know, I guess that there's a, a point that you can make that maybe she didn't know where Keating got his money. But during his trial, she sent a letter to Lance Ito of the uh, O.J. Simpson fame uh, saying that he was an okay guy. And then after they threw Keating's ass in jail, the district attorney in the case uh, wrote her and asked her to give some of the money back so that they could distribute it back to the victims. And Mother Teresa's response Crickets and tumbleweeds. Well, she didn't stop there. She also had some financial dealings with a very uh, crooked British publisher named Robert Maxwell. Yeah. And he embezzled over $450 million from people 
Um, and again, more money, Mother Teresa never gave back. You know, it, it just seems to me when you look at the Devaliers, when you look at Keating, and you look at Maxwell, this was just same song, second verse. She didn't care where she got the money. Now, I guess it, it should be pretty easy to find out everything that she was doing because every legitimate charity in the world is required to file financial disclosure documents. Now, certainly she did that, didn't she? Well, the problem is, is where do you do the filing? The United States does a very good job of this. Most European countries do a pretty good job of keeping track of charitable donations. The Vatican is officially a city of one. The, only, the official population of the Vatican is the Pope. And the Vatican Bank is where she kept all her money. So there was practically no accountability. And in fairness to her, there weren't a whole lot of people asking for it at the time. Everyone assumed the money was going where it should, was being handled in an appropriate way. Uh, but to this day, we really don't know what all happened with her money, who all was involved. Uh, her, her religious order was not trained people. They weren't trained nurses. They weren't trained bankers. They were just basically people willing to give up their, their lives to follow Mother Teresa around, much like a groupie or a, or a cult follower. <laughs> well, okay. And I, I say that with some credibility because I knew people who joined her order when I was in college. I knew two girls who went and joined her order. Wow. Uh, never heard from them again. It felt much like, a, like a, uh, someone who joined a cult. Wow. Well, you know, I guess I can understand that Mother Teresa would stonewall on the financial disclosures and not tell anyone where it was. It seems weird to me that somebody in, a, in an international charity could avoid financial disclosure. I mean, <laughs> that's as weird as some uh, narcissistic sociopath businessman running for president of the United States that wouldn't give up his tax returns before he was elected. <laughs> How is that even possible? <laughs> But when you told me that she was parking her money at the Vatican Bank, well, I mean, come on. Clearly, that money is gone. It's down the rabbit hole. You know, I guess if the movie Scarface had Tony Montana laundering his money at the Vatican Bank, that movie would have turned out a whole lot differently. We'd probably be talking about St. Tony today. Now, Randy, I've always considered myself a feminist. And I completely understand why some women don't like men. Men can be idiots. That's why I don't date them. But what I've never understood is why women hate on women. And Mama T was definitely a mean girl. What do you know about that? Well, we know that she, like many Catholics, had very hardcore views when it came to abortion. Mm -hmm. um, I, in full disclosure, have to admit I used to be one of those. I was a member of Operation Rescue when I was in, uh, in, my, in my college years. And we had a fanatical view on this issue and uh, to the point where we didn't care what the women going through this very trying time we're dealing with as long as this baby was saved. And we didn't much care what happened to the baby after it was born because we're now subjecting it to this very mother that we um, deemed so uh, inappropriate for considering having an abortion to begin with. So there's, there's a little bit of hypocrisy there. And Mother Teresa was the center point of that rally cry when the abortion issue was at its height in the late 70s and early 80s. And um, she would go so far as to have no sympathy at all for rape victims who were having to deal with abortion. And um, that, that was not a pretty picture. If you imagine what it's got to be like going through all the trauma associated with the rape that when they uh, become impregnated, um, we were taught that it was impossible for a person to become impregnated when they were raped, which is ridiculous. Um, but, uh, but uh, Mother Teresa uh, was was very strong in the in the whole abortion movement. Um, 
I I was in high school when all that started and I bought it all hook, line, and sinker. Well, I've always thought that if you don't believe in abortion, don't have an abortion. It's like if you don't believe in gay marriage, don't get gay married. I've known a few women in my life that have terminated pregnancies. And I will tell you, there is not a one of them that have thought that this was the best option in the world, but it was the necessary option. Well, I think we can have a whole episode about, about abortion and the, uh, the, the church's response to it, but Mother Teresa um, was the focal point of the Catholic Church at that time. And, you know, I wonder if the church would have gone the way that it did were it, were it not for her. This was a very important topic to her. She once said the greatest poverty she ever saw in the world was in the United States because of all the aborted babies that were here. And uh, which is kind of a slap in the face to the real poverty that was out there. Well, you know, if she was so anti-abortion, at least she must have been uh, in favor of contraception. Oh, no. Mother Teresa believed in natural family planning. And sad to say, I was uh, a participant of that plan. I engaged in natural family planning, and her name is Samantha. So, I think that's the old joke. What do you call that? They call it the rhythm method, right? That's what it was used to be called. And then they put a natural family planning was a spin to make it sound better than uh, than the rhythm method. But it basically was the same thing. I think the old joke was, what do you call people that use the rhythm method of birth control? Parents. Parents. Yeah. And that's how. That's exactly how well it worked out for me and my first wife. And um, not that I. Uh, don't love my daughter. She's the most amazing person in the world. Um, but it was there would have been a better time for us to have started a family than that. But we were good Catholics at the time, and uh, we we participated in this. And um, natural family planning d- does not have a uh, an accounting for a couple of wine coolers on a Saturday night. So it, it takes a, a, an awful lot of discipline, um, and even then, it's not foolproof. Well, if, if you're anti-abortion and you don't like contraceptives, what approach can you take to not having kids? Well, they don't want you to not have kids. They want you to have kids. The Catholic Church has been one that has promoted large families since its beginning. I am one of nine children. Uh, my parents were good German Catholics and prided themselves. All their siblings had lots of kids and they all remain Catholic. Um, I was fortunate enough that my father was one who wanted to get away from the little Catholic community that he lived in and move to the city. And so uh, my siblings and I are the only ones who didn't have a whole lot of kids. Our, all our cousins have lots of kids as well. So it's... Well, how about for people that are not married? Then what do you do? Uh, well, you just don't have sex, Carl. That's what God per- that's, doesn't want anybody who's not married to have sex. Abstinence. Yeah. Well, gee, um, it, it works every time it's tried, Carl. Well, the science, the, the studies show that it doesn't really work all that well because it's not really used all that often. Even nice people like having sex, so I'm told, so I read. <laughs> Number two on our list, she punched down on the poor and dying. What do you know about this? Well. The most appealing part of Mother Teresa when you were a Catholic was all the amazing things that she was doing for the poor in India. The caste system has been going on in India for tens of thousands of years, and if you're familiar with that system, that is where certain classes of people uh, wouldn't even look upon other classes of people in their society, and the people on the very lowest got the worst health care the worst food, um, they were treated in a, in a pretty shabby way. And she felt that was her mission, was to show that these people had value. And to an American watching this on TV in the 1980s in, in Texas, it all looked like she was doing these amazing things because she would set up these hospitals and bring these poor people in, and she would uh, give them care and, and, and seemingly be helping them. 
But what we've learned since then was these were not real hospitals. There were no doctors there. There were no trained nurses there. There were just other nuns who were trained in the most basic ways of giving painkillers. So she was trying to ease their suffering, but pretty much if you walked into one of these facilities, it was a death sentence. People didn't walk out. Um, the assumption was that you were dying, and though many of them were, if you happened to not be dying and you went in there, you were gonna be dying pretty soon. And uh, you would lay on a cot that was just a few inches off the floor around very, very sick people who were probably contagious and diseases just spread around. The, the um, nuns that would be treating you would often reuse needles. They wouldn't sterilize them. They would barely rinse them off and, um, you know, and pass them from person to person. And um, the, the, the horrible affliction these folks had got worse. And we now know from some confessions of some of these nuns that uh, when they were in their last stages, Mother Teresa had all these people baptized as Catholics so that they could go to heaven. And many of them never had any idea what a Catholic was. They'd been Hindu their whole life. And um, it was a bait and switch in the worst possible way. Well, it seems kind of weird to me that everyone is saying what a good job Mother Teresa did. I mean, I guess the, the Nazi doctor, Joseph Mengele, made house calls, but I'm not really sure it was all that great a deal. And, you know, as far as this suffering thing goes, I'm going to guess that a bunch of terminally ill Hindus in Calcutta, if given the choice between the kiss of Jesus and a shot of morphine, would have picked the shot of morphine. But since that wasn't really offered to them because they didn't even keep painkillers at these facilities, uh, I'm guessing it might have been something like, oh, the kiss of Jesus. Yes, I would like the kiss of Jesus on my ass. Now I want to say something to all the ex-Catholics that are out there because um, you'll understand this better than most, but the Catholic Church is, has always been obsessed with suffering. When my mother was dying in her last stages at 85 years old, um, the priest told her that don't, uh, don't misuse your suffering. Offer it to Jesus. And that meant a lot to my mother, who, grew, who spent her 85 years as Catholic, who used her pain uh, that she had a lot of in the last part of her life, and she would felt like that that was being given to her by Jesus for a reason, and I guess that gave her a certain amount of comfort towards the end. Um, and I was sensible enough not to share with her what a warped idea that is. That why would any loving deity want you to suffer and somehow that's a positive thing? But Mother Teresa bought into that. That was very much a Catholic thing, so she didn't invent it. Um, it, it has always been there that suffering has virtue. Well, I got to tell you, in my case, if suffering is beautiful, I'd be looking for some ugly in my life. <laughs> uh, they say that these things are character building. I would be in a fire sale getting rid of character. Well, I'll tell you, the one thing that I hate above everything else is a hypocrite. And if you look in the dictionary under hypocrite, you're going to see a picture of Mama T. She is the queen of contradiction. She is the doyenne of do as I say, not as I do. Number one on our list, hyper-hypocrite. You know, it would seem to me with all this money that she had been able to raise, that she would have wanted to spend that money on the poor and the dying, right? Well, this is probably the area where she was the biggest hypocrite. Mother Teresa did have massive amounts of money, though we'll never know exactly how much. Very little of it was spent on these people. Again, she didn't hire doctors, she didn't hire nurses. She did not put in full beds in the hospital. They were cots that laid on the ground. Uh, there's a story of how there was an attempt to put one of these facilities in New York City, and New York City had a requirement that any 
building over two stories would require an elevator. And she chose not to build the facility at all if the expense of putting an elevator in it was going to be part of this. And so this, a lot of this I think goes back to she sold on this imagery of her helping the poor, so they needed to look poor. Putting them in nice hospital beds uh, didn't fit the image that she wanted. She wanted them to look poor. And, um, and you watch old video footage of her, and uh, you, you get the impression that she doesn't have control over the abysmal environment these people are in, but she had complete control over it. She had more money than... than um, the God, <laughs> and um, and and chose not to use it, you know. And then it comes back to the ultimate question of why did she do all this? Because she was an evil person, or did she do all this because she had a misconception of what doing the right thing was? And that's a question that that can be debated. Well, it's a little um, confusing to me that wanting to see people present themselves as poor is a good thing while you're flying private in Charles Keating's private jet around the country. Uh, there's one set of rules for her, one set of rules for the poor, one set of rules for uh, normal people getting divorced and normal people using contraceptives and different rules for her friends like Princess Diana and Indira Gandhi. Well, and this is why our good, dear departed friend Christopher Hitchens was who brought this point to uh, to all of our attention when he was asked by the Vatican to be the devil's advocate for her sainthood nomination. He was brought in, which has been the tradition of the Catholic Church for over a thousand years when they wanted to make somebody a saint, to present a case against why they should be a saint. And Christopher Hitchens took this very seriously. And he did it in such a way that um, he exposed all these horrible things about Mother Teresa. And did the church take it seriously? Did the church um, stop the process in, in its tracks? No, they, asked, they quietly asked Christopher Hitchens to step aside and they went ahead and made her a saint anyway. Well, Randy, I think we've pretty much put the needle in the balloon of Mother Teresa right now. So we're gonna sign off. Uh, I'm Carl Merritt, the liberal atheist comic I'm Randall Theo. I am the president of the Dallas and Fort Worth chapter of the Freedom from Religion Foundation. And before we go, a little teaser for our next episode. I don't want to tell you who it is, but he's known as the Tangerine Twat. See you next time.